The title of this sermon for this morning is Role Models of Faith, as, uh, as Cade mentioned. Role Models of Faith. And I want to read uh, this passage before we dive in to each individual verse, starting in verse 7. The Apostle Paul says, As to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bondservant in the Lord, will bring you information. For I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number, they will inform you about the whole situation here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Barnabas, his cousin Mark, about whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And also Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, and they have proved to be an encouragement to me. And by the way, the, the scriptures are not going to be up on the screens this morning, uh, so you can follow along with me in your Bibles uh, today. Now, uh, if you're like me, it, it's tempting and even easy when you read an introduction to an epistle or even a conclusion to an epistle to kind of breeze through it and to think that there's nothing here to learn from God's Word. But then uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 reminds us that all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Every jot and tittle of the Word of God is God-breathed. And God does not waste words. God does not give us empty sentences or, or filler words. Everything in Scripture is profitable for our instruction. Now, there are parts in the Bible that are more important than other parts of the Bible. Uh, not every doctrine is, is of equal importance. Uh, there are portions of Scripture that are more packed theologically and which teach us deeper and more important truths than other parts. For example, uh, what the Bible teaches about hospitality is not as important as the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so not everything is of equal importance, but everything that the Bible has to say is important to one degree or another. And so all of that to say that even though this is the conclusion of the epistle, here Paul begins to, to say his final greetings to the saints, uh, there is much that we can learn in this passage. And what we find here are examples, role models of faith. Role models are, are very important to have in life. We all desire to have a concrete example that we can see and study and follow to a certain degree. Someone that we can imitate. And we see this, for example, in the realm of athletics. Uh, athletes, famous athletes, often talk about the athletes that they grew up watching and following and imitating, desiring to follow in their footsteps. In, in 1991, there was this commercial that Gatorade put out, and it was about Michael Jordan. And it had a song to it with a video, one minute video. And, and the message was, be like Mike. I want to be like Mike. And I kind of drank that Kool-Aid, <laughs> Gatorade in that, in that instance. And, and I thought I could be like Mike. So one time I went and I bought the entire outfit for like 200 bucks when I was in fifth grade. But it didn't change my, my game at all in basketball. But, but the message they were getting across is, if you drink Gatorade, you'll be like Mike. And the idea is you'll be able to play like Michael Jordan. Uh, we see role models in, in the area of business. Uh, people will often seek out a, a mentor. Uh, and a mentor is, is in many ways a role model that you can learn from and in many ways imitate. They, they teach you the ropes and the profession that you're following. And, and so role models are so important. And every one of us has role models in life, uh, one or, or more than one. And children, 
inevitably look up to someone to, to study them, how they speak, how they act. And primarily, a, a, a child's role model is who? The person or the people that raised them. And that's why it's so important in life to be a good role model. And for us this morning to be a godly role model. Uh, I think one of the, the biggest issues, the biggest problems that we see today with the children and teenagers in our society is a lack of godly role models. They don't have good examples to follow. And so the parents, if they're home at all, uh, they're not a good example to, to emulate. And so what do they have? They, they turn to what are called today influencers, uh, TikTok influencers and social media influencers. These are people who, who are teaching our children how to behave. And they're not good examples. Now, now, we don't want to lay all of the blame on role models because we each bear our own sin. All of us are responsible for our actions. We're, we don't have to follow anyone. We can choose not to follow a role model. But by and large, I would say that it's a big issue. It's a big problem today. A lack of godly role models. It's the same thing in the Christian faith. It's the same thing in the Christian faith. We as saints have other saints that we look up to. Examples of godliness. Examples of faithfulness. Examples of what it looks like to walk out this Christian faith. And that's not wrong. It's not unspiritual to desire to have a role model in the Christian faith because Paul himself often urged Christians to follow in his footsteps, to follow in his example. For example, Philippians 3.17, which Cade read for us this morning, Paul says to the saints, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. And, and so Paul is saying, follow me, imitate me, Walk as I walk, and also imitate those who walk according to that same pattern that I am following. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, Paul says to the Corinthians, Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Now what Paul was saying there is not that he was a sinless, perfect example to follow. Because as Cade read for us this morning, Paul had his own faults. He had not yet attained to maturity in the faith. But what Paul is saying is, to the extent, to the degree that I follow Christ, copy that. And to the degree that I fail in imitating Christ, don't copy that. Because Christ Jesus is our ultimate role model and example. God Himself. In 1 John 2, 6, that's what it says. Whoever says he abides in Him, ought to walk in the same way in which He walked, that is, Jesus Christ. And so Christ is our ultimate example. But we desire to see other examples of what it looks like to follow Christ. And in this passage, we find a few of those. A few examples of what it looks like to live as a Christian. And the first example we have is in verse 7. This is the first heading. I'm going to give you four examples today. Four, four role models of the faith. Example one. Tychicus, an example of faithful service. Tychicus, an, an example of faithful service. Look at verse 7. Paul says, As to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bondservant in the Lord, will bring you information. Now, we don't have a lot of information in the Scriptures as to who this man is, Tychicus, but we know enough to know that he was a man from Asia Minor, and that he was accompanying Paul in his third missionary journey, according to Acts 20 and verse 4. And also we know, as we see here, that he was a faithful servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice here, as Paul describes him in a threefold way, First, as a, as a beloved brother. He says, our beloved brother. This man was a cherished brother in Christ. A fellow member of the family of God. Adopted through Christ Jesus. Secondly, he describes him as a faithful servant. 
The word servant here is the Greek word diakonos, from which we get the word deacon. Uh, this word can also be translated minister, as someone who is in the service of other people. And in this context, uh, Tychicus was a servant to the Apostle Paul. He was helping Paul in his ministry. Paul is saying Tychicus is a person who has a servant's heart. He's a servant to other people. And he's not just any servant. He says he is a faithful servant. Tychicus was trustworthy, dependable, responsible to the degree that the Apostle Paul could entrust him to deliver this Holy Spirit-inspired letter to the Colossian Christians, along with the letter to the Ephesians, and as well to the, as the letter to Philemon. This was a faithful man. But third, and above all, he is described as a fellow bond servant in the Lord, a fellow slave in Christ. You see, Paul and Tychicus, they served the same master, the Lord Jesus Christ. They had one master in heaven, and together they were working in lockstep to further the gospel of Jesus Christ and to expand the kingdom of God upon this earth. Brother, servant, slave. This is how Paul is describing his fellow gospel ministers in this passage. In verse 10, he describes Aristarchus as my fellow prisoner. Uh, these are not celebrity descriptions. Servant, slave, brother, prisoner. This is what we are as Christians. And this is all that we are as Christians. There are no first grade and second grade Christians. There are no Christians who have a special in with God that the rest of people do not have. As these false teachers in Colossae were, were proclaiming, they were saying, we have this special knowledge that you need if you want to get closer to God, if you really want to be spiritual. There are no Christians who have a, a special filling of the Holy Spirit that other Christians do not have, as so many people teach today. There are people who say today that some Christians are baptized by the Holy Spirit and some aren't. But biblically, if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, you can't be a Christian. And so all saints, all saints have the Holy Spirit baptism, without which you cannot be in the body of Christ. In 1 John 2.20, John says to the, to the saints, But you have an anointing, that is, the Holy Spirit, from the Holy One, and you all know. You all know. In 1 Corinthians 12, in verse 13, listen to what Paul says here. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. It is one Spirit, it is one body. There's no unity otherwise. And so we are all here children to the same Father in heaven, brothers and sisters in Christ. We are all slaves and servants to one Lord. And Jesus said in Matthew 20, 26, whoever wishes to become great among you shall be what? Your servant. And whoever wishes to be first shall be your slave, even as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. <clears throat> Servants. This is how God defines greatness. The world tells you you have to climb to the top. You have to be the top dog. You have to sit at the top level in the skyscraper. You have to sit on the big chair to be great. Jesus says, you have to stoop as low as you can to be great. You see, His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And the things that are highly esteemed by men in the world are detestable to God. Service, faithful service, is what God desires. That is greatness in the kingdom. Now, you're, you're not great in the sense that you're different you're still a slave or a servant, but you're a great servant, right? 
And so here's a good reminder for us this morning that we are all ministers. All of us here this morning are ministers if we are Christians. There's no such thing really as the minister in a local church. And by that I mean the pastor or the elders who do everything and the body does nothing. Because that's what the scripture what that's what the church is. It's a body with different members, each member having a different function to play for the edification of the body. Ephesians 4, 11 through 12 says that pastors were given to the church by God for the work of service, diakonia, to the upbuilding of the body of Christ. In Ephesians 2.10, it says that God has prepared works for all of us to walk in. All of us have a ministry to fulfill before the eyes of Christ. And we all ought to strive to hear those words from Jesus. Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Matthew 25, verse 23. So Tychicus was faithful. And, and that's demonstrated by the fact that he delivered this letter to Colossae all the way from Rome. We're talking about hundreds of miles, much of it on foot. This man denied his own comfort. He was sacrificial with his time. He was sacrificial with his energy. He didn't take the easiest task. He was a sacrificial servant. But specifically, Paul says that he had two tasks to fulfill. And we read about that in verse 8. Look at verse 8. Paul says, For I have sent him, Tychicus, to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. And so the first purpose for Tychicus going, other than delivering this letter, was to inform the Colossian saints as to how the Apostle Paul was doing, as to his affairs. How's he doing physically? How's his ministry doing in his imprisonment? Why? Well, so they could pray for him specifically. Maybe also to know if there were any needs that the apostle had, which the church could meet, like the Philippians did for Paul. But then generally, perhaps, because even though they never met the apostle Paul, they still cared for him. Epaphras likely told them much about this apostle and his sufferings for the gospel. There was no Twitter back then. There was no phones. There was no television. Airplanes, everything had to be done by a personal messenger. And here's a reminder for us this morning to never forget our missionaries. To never forget our missionaries. We ought to always be in contact with our missionaries. How are they doing? How's their health? How's their ministry? Do they have any needs that we can possibly meet as a church? Do they, do they have any needs that we can pray for as a church? Because even though not every Christian was called to be a missionary, every Christian is called to missions. And the local church is a missional church. We are to be caring for those who we send out. Paul Washer puts it this way. He says, either climb the rope or you hold the rope for those who go down. Either way, you're involved. And by holding the rope, it means providing for them, supporting them, praying for them. One of, the, one of the biggest, one of the saddest comments I've ever heard from missionaries is that after a while, out of sight, out of mind, they feel forgotten. They feel abandoned by the church that sent them. And they feel as if they've disappeared from the face of the world. We need to be careful that that does not happen with our missionaries. We must always be praying, remembering, contacting them. And if in any way able, providing for them. And as a side note, we are, we are all missionaries here this morning. When you go to work in the morning, you're a missionary. When you go on vacation, you're a missionary. When you go to the grocery store, you're a missionary. Because we are all tasked with what? Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sharing the gospel so that men and women might be saved. All of us are missionaries. All of us. 
The second, Tychicus' second purpose was to encourage their hearts. To encourage their hearts. This was also expressed by the Apostle Paul in Colossians 2 and verse 2, where he said that he desired that their hearts, that the hearts of the saints, may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, united in love, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the fullness of assurance and understanding resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself. Tychicus was not just sent to deliver a letter, but to encourage their hearts. The, the word to encourage means to, to instill courage and cheer into a person. He, he was sent to strengthen them spiritually, to strengthen them emotionally, their hearts, their innermost being. You see, Tychicus was more than a mailman. He, he was gifted in the area of encouraging as well. And it's likely that he would have encouraged them by reading this letter out loud and then fleshing out its truths, much like what happens in a sermon. He was to encourage them. And he was gifted in this way. And we know that because Paul says the same thing of him in, Ephes in Ephesians 6, verse 21 through 22. Paul says of Tychicus, but that you also may know about my circumstances, how I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make everything known to you. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, so that you may know about us, and that he may comfort your hearts. See, the Colossians needed encouragement in the face of false teaching that was threatening the church. The Colossians needed encouragement in general because of the trials that accompany the Christian life. All of the hardships and the persecution in the Christian life. And we all need encouragement here this morning. We need to be comforted. Why? Because the trials of life that they experience, we experience in the same way. Because the attacks of the evil one and our own failures are relentless when we fall short. We need to be encouraged. But we need more than empty words from, from the world. We need more than superficial encouragement from the world that just says to you, it's going to be okay, just press on. Just put on a happy face. Be stoic. We need more. We need the encouragement of the Scriptures. We need the truth of God's Word, which is an ointment to the weary soul. It's medicine to the soul that is in distress. In Romans 15 and verse 4, Paul said, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through the perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. The Scriptures give us encouragement because they tell us things as they really are. Things are messed up in the world. There is sin in the world. Dennis just shared with me out back there that Amazon is paying their employees $4,000 to go have an abortion at a state. Things are a mess. The world is evil. There is sin. But they don't leave us there. The Scriptures also give us hope. Real hope. Living hope. And so don't, don't tell me it's going to be okay. Just press on with nothing to back it up. Tell me it's going to be okay. Press on because God. Because God. Because what He has done. Because what He is doing. And what He will do. Because of His redemption. Because He has filled you with the Holy Spirit. He's keeping you to the end. He will see you all the way through to glory. But God. Yes, things are a mess. But God. Martin Lloyd-Jones once said, once said, thank God for all the buts in the Bible. And he, he preached two sermons on but God. But God. It changes everything. When we forget God in our circumstances and trials, we, we get discouraged. We lose hope. We must remember God and turn to the Scriptures for encouragement. And so what an amazing commendation from the Apostle Paul for, for this believer. Uh, let us strive to be as faithful. Let us strive to be as sacrificial and loyal and steadfast and unwavering 
as Tychicus. Second example is Onesimus. This is the second heading. Onesimus, an example of true repentance. Verse 9. Onesimus, an example of true repentance. And with him, with Tychicus, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number, they will inform you about the whole situation here. And so what Paul's saying here is that along with Tychicus, he was also sending Onesimus to Colossae, although for a different reason. Who's Onesimus? Onesimus is a runaway slave who was returning now to his earthly master, Philemon. Philemon was one of the only individuals in the Bible to receive a personal letter from the Apostle Paul to also be included in the canon of Scripture right between Titus and the book of Hebrews. And it's one chapter, 25 verses. So if, if the pages of your Bible stick, as mine often do, you'll miss it. It's just one page. And it's a short letter to Philemon. Now, if you read Philemon, you learn much more about Onesimus. Uh, you learn that apparently this, this slave, he stole money from Philemon and he fled. He ran away to Rome to get lost in the crowd. And apparently that was a common occurrence with runaway slaves. They would run to Rome and get lost in the vast population, just become another face in the crowd. Now in God's providence, Onesimus meets Paul in Rome and is converted under his ministry. And now as a Christian, Paul is sending him back to his master in Colossae in obedience to what Paul taught in Colossians 3.22-25, that, that slaves are to be subject to their masters. Now what we have here is a, is a beautiful story of true repentance. Because Onesimus had left Philemon a disobedient, unfaithful slave. He was coming back. Notice how Paul describes him as a faithful and beloved brother in Christ. Returning to his master in obedience to God's word. Now if you read Philemon, Paul encourages him to receive Onesimus back as more than a slave now, but as a true brother in Christ Jesus. So by returning to, to his earthly master, Onesimus was proving to be faithful and a true brother in Christ. Obedience to the word of God is proof of life in Christ, as I said last week. And this is what the fruit of repentance looks like. Here's a good example. There are things that many of us have done as unbelievers in our past life. We've hurt people. We have left people at a disadvantage in some way. We have torn relationships with our sin. That the gospel would say to us, we ought to mend. We ought to do everything within our power to mend those relationships within reason. I don't think God would require us to remember every kid we, we beat up in preschool and call them back and talk things out. Probably deserved it anyway. But specific issues that the Spirit convicts us of, as, as it does here, as it shows here, we must strive to make things right. Because the blood of Christ does cleanse us of all our sins. But the fruit of that cleansing is evidenced by our actions and our desires to make things right with people that we have harmed, just as Onesimus did. Another example is Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. I'm going to start singing that song. A wee little man was he. Um... We have time. Let's turn to Luke 19. This is just an amazing account of true repentance. Luke 19. <clears throat> it's one of my favorite accounts in the Gospel of Luke. Zacchaeus is converted. Luke 
And I'll read to you this account in, 19, in Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. It says that he, that is Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus uh, was and was unable because of the crowd, for he was a small in stature, a wee little man. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. And when they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be a guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. Notice how Jesus responds. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus comes to Zacchaeus' house. Obviously, he is saved. The Lord redeems him. He gives him a new heart. A new, he's, a, he's made into a new creation in Christ. How does Zacchaeus respond to that? I will give half of my possessions to the poor. If I have defrauded anyone, I will restore four times as much. How does Jesus respond to that? Today salvation has come to this house. What was Jesus saying? That because he's going to do all these things, he's earning his salvation? No. Jesus is saying, behold, he has been saved. Look at the evidence. Look at the evidence of this conversion. He, he wants to make things right with those whom he has left, have left at a disadvantage. And so I wonder if there's anyone here this morning who needs to make a phone call, who, who needs to meet with a family member or a co-worker or, or a friend and restore a relationship that was damaged because of our sin. God will convict us of these things and we must be obedient to those urgings of the Holy Spirit. You may be rejected by that person, but we can do the right thing. That's all we have within our power is what we can do. Let's be like Onesimus and Zacchaeus in demonstrating the true fruit of repentance. The third example is Aristarchus, an example of valor. Aristarchus, an example of valor. In verse 10, the first half of verse 10. Paul says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings. Now, we don't know much about Aristarchus except for the fact that he was also a traveling companion with Paul in his third missionary journey. He was from Macedonia. And here Paul calls him a fellow prisoner. And so it's likely like, that this man chose deliberately to remain imprisoned with Paul in Rome by his own choice and to be of service to the Apostle Paul. Because if you read at the end of the book of Acts, it tells us that Paul had a degree of freedom to receive his friends that they would minister to him and to share the gospel with anyone that would come to listen. In Philemon verse 24, Aristarchus is described as a fellow soldier. A fellow soldier. And when I think of a soldier, I think of, of valor. I think of courage. I think of fortitude. I think of strength. And this is what this disciple displayed. And we have an example of that in Acts 19. I'm going to try to do my best to just summarize the account. In Acts 19, Paul is in Ephesus and he preaches the gospel for two whole years. And it says that after those two years, everyone in Asia heard the word of God. So many people were turning away from idols to serve the Lord Jesus Christ that it was affecting the business of the silversmiths and the craftsmen in, in Ephesus who were in the business of making idols to sell to people. And so the people were no longer buying them to worship idols because they had turned to Christ. 
So their business was suffering, so what did they do? They stirred up the entire city, making a, a mob that rushed into the theater in Ephesus. This theater was like a, a stadium that could hold 25,000 people. And it says in Acts 19, verse 24, I believe, that Aristarchus and Gaius were dragged into the theater by this angry mob because of their association with the Apostle Paul, because they were proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, as the story unfolds, it turns out that Aristarchus and his friend Gaius escaped unharmed. They were let go. But what would you have done if, because you're a Christian, because you follow Christ, and you're associated with those that follow Christ, if an angry mob dragged you into an NFL stadium, what would you do? A situation that could have cost him his life. Would you have folded your tent and gone home? Would you have denied your faith? Would I have deserted the ministry altogether to stay safe? Aristarchus responded in the opposite way. He was undeterred. Because in the very next chapter, in Acts 20, it says that he continued on with Paul, stayed by his side in the ministry. All the way to Acts 27, he's still with Paul in the ship. All the way to here, he's in prison with Paul, serving him in prison, sacrificing his own life to serve the apostle. What do we learn here? Well, what's going to happen when the mob comes for us? What's going to happen when, when there's a mob that forms because we preach the gospel, because we associate with those who preach the gospel? How are we going to respond? Because we live in an age of angry mobs. Uh, there's a mob against those who say that... Uh, Life begins at conception. And who proclaim the sanctity of life according to the word. There, there's a mob against those who hold to the biblical view of marriage between one man and one woman. And to the biblical view of sexuality. There are political mobs. There's a mob for this and that. And last summer we, we witnessed riots all over the streets. Cities burning. Businesses burning. People dying. What's going to happen if a mob comes to us. In a smaller scale, what happens when a group of people gather themselves at work and, and come against you because you're a Christian? Even on social media, what happens when a group of people attack you when you're proclaiming Christ? Let us be as Aristarchus was, who displayed courage and boldness, fortitude and resilience. This is an example of standing fast in the face of physical harm. That's my son. <laughs> I know that scream. The last example I, we have here is that of Mark in the second half of verse 10. Mark, an example of redemption. And not in the salvific sense, not in the sense that you are saved from hell, from wrath, but in the sense that he redeemed himself by his actions. Paul says in, in four, verse, uh, chapter 4, the second half of verse 10, And also Barnabas' cousin Mark, about whom you received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. Now, there's a lot more about Mark in, in Scripture than the other guys, but I'm just going to give you a snapshot. This is the man who's also called John Mark in the Bible and other places. John Mark or John Mark. And this was the man who deserted the Apostle, Paul, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, his cousin, who was another associate of Paul's, in their first missionary journey. Uh, apparently things got hard in the ministry. He got cold feet and he returned home. He, he left the Apostle in the field. He left Barnabas. And then when Mark wanted to join Barnabas and Apostle in the second missionary journey, Paul said no way, because he had proven to be unfaithful in service. He was not reliable. He deserted the mission. But, however, as we see here, 
It's obvious that by the time Paul wrote this letter, he had reconciled with Mark. Mark had redeemed himself in some way that the Apostle Paul now considered him a co-worker in Christ. And in fact, in 2 Timothy 4.11, right before the death of Paul, he tells Timothy to pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. What do we learn about Mark? Or from Mark's example, we learn that, or he is an, an encouragement to us, because sometimes we resemble Mark's character. We waver in our faith. We waver in ministry. We turn away from the challenges of ministry. We fail our Lord. And so it's no surprise to find in the Bible that Mark was very closely related to or friends with uh, the Apostle Peter, who himself displayed perhaps the, the worst form of temporary defection in the Bible when he denied Christ three times. He probably learned from Peter that you could turn back, that you could repent and do the right thing. And so my, my, my word to you from Scripture here this morning is take courage in knowing that even when you are a Peter or a Mark, that there is abundant grace in Jesus Christ for us to turn, to return, and to serve Him faithfully. The Colossians likely heard of Mark's pitiful past actions, so the Apostle here says, to receive him, that they had received instructions about him, perhaps from Barnabas himself, to not reject him, but to receive him into their congregation. Amazingly, this man would go on to write one of the four Gospels in the Bible. A tremendous privilege. This is the same Mark. Paul then ends this section in verse 11 saying, and also Jesus, who is called Justice. We don't know anything about this man except for what's here. Evidently, he was a righteous man, as his name indicates, and the apostles' commendation of him would support that. He says, These are the only fellow workers of the, for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, meaning that these were believing Jews. These were Messianic Jews. He's talking about Mark, Aristarchus, and uh, Justice. These were the only men from, from Paul's nationality, from the Jews who were serving alongside Paul to expand the kingdom of God through the proclamation of the gospel. And Paul said, Paul says here, he ends by saying, uh, these men are the only ones who proved to be an encouragement to me. And the word proved here is the same word that we found in verse 7 or verse 8 of Tychicus, encouraging the hearts of believers. The word encourage here. The saints needed encouragement. The apostle needed encouragement. And by their service to Paul and standing alongside of him, they, they proved to be a help to the apostle Paul. Four tremendous examples of faith. And one final word here uh, is on the word proved. They proved to be an encouragement to me. How does a person prove something? Well, to bring Michael Jordan illustration back, how did Michael Jordan prove to be, in many's eyes, the, the best basketball player to ever live? Because I would argue that many NBA players could have a Michael Jordan type game with the same statistics. What separates Jordan from everyone else? Consistency. Consistency. Doing the right thing over and over and over again. Being faithful. Being faithful. Let us be faithful as we serve Christ and encouraged to know that when we fail, there's abundant grace to return. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word, for these tremendous role models of faith that you have given us, men that we can read about, imperfect men, but men that served you, men that loved you, men that displayed their weaknesses, that we can 
associate with. We thank you, Lord, that we have the examples of Peter and Mark to know that when we do fail, that we can turn to you again and be received and fulfill the ministry that you've given to us. We thank you and pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.